Hello, welcome to my talk. So first of all, uh, maybe confused if you saw this, uh, the program schedule a while ago. So originally, uh, Marianne Duffy and Akshansha was going to give the talk here. So I'm not Mo, I'm not Akshansha, which is a problem for you because actually I have no clue how AI works. So uh, at my first training on AI, like four months ago, we started internal training. I started hacking on the Instra program, Instra lab project. And so my current role is like, if you think that a data scientist, like the race car driver, driving an AI race car, well, I'm the mechanic. I uh, provide uh, foundational support, and yeah, that's AI generated. Uh, one of my first attempts to actually make a picture with like, from red fedora, mechanic, Formula One, yeah. Took me like several attempts and several credits, but well, it worked out. So. Uh, my expertise actually is uh, Python. I've been doing Python for over 20 years, uh, Python packaging, PyPI, all these rather uh, complicated, boring bits and pieces. I uh, helped off with containerization. Uh, hi, Dan. And I also work on hardware enablement. So I started with AMD Rock M because I have a Rock M machine at home, so a, a workstation I don't use for gaming at all. And then helped out with Intel Gaudi support. That's one of the AI accelerators. Yeah, but why do we actually need saving from AI or in the AI realm? Um, I think that boils down, it's probably one of my most important slides, is literacy. And uh, in, we live in a democracy, in a democracy, we need to have well-educated, well-informed people. And back in the old days, it means you could read a book, you could write a letter, you could do some basic maths, you didn't get cheated when you buy groceries got more and more complicated, like 20, 25 years ago, something, the internet came up. So, and having some basic coding skills, but basic, I mean like Excel sheets or doing some very simple Python scripting helps. And now with AI coming up, people, like ordinary people, not just engineers, developers, testers, should know at least a bit about how like a prompt works and how the dangers and the benefits of AI when to use it or how to recognize a deep fake. That's, I think, very, very critical. Yeah. So the agenda for the talk is going to be, I'm going to start with some general comments regarding hardware and software. Um, then how we are trying to make AI more accessible and open, with open source, of course. Uh, introduction to the lab approach. That's the lab and instruct lab. The Instruct Lab uh, itself, you can do a step-by-step, -step, well, not demo, uh, demo maybe on the end, uh, had lots of technical issues, I will go into that later on, but uh, show some slides and hopefully do an active demo at the very end. So, why do we need actually special hardware? So this is one of the demo I recorded a while ago. Uh, this is a very beefy machine with one of 12 uh, CPUs and every uh, physical CPU core is like spinning at almost 95% and it's spitting out some text. So it takes a while, uh, even longer and longer and longer. And so it's a high-end machine, but it's not very efficient, not very like responsive. But if you do the same thing on specialized hardware, specialized hardware, huh, uh, like a GPU, uh, now you see on the left side the GPU is spinning up and uh, well, it's already done. So it's like a um, least one a magnitude faster to do even simple inference, so chatting on a, a GPU, a specialized hardware. And even, so my 800 euro card at home is still like uh, 10 times faster than this super high-end dual slot Intel Gold Xenon server processor. So that's why we need specialized hardware for AI, and that's why some of the companies uh, stock price like went up really, really, really crazy. And this is also a problem for open source, but we have kind of an answer for that, which I get into too. So AI, uh, well, if you are like me, uh, AI is like the new uh, like uh, NFT or the new uh, blockchain. It's kind of a bit of, like annoying to get bombarded with AI, but there's actually, AI is a very, very old topic. It's been around for many, many decades, and there are different fields from recognizing like for cars, recognizing street signs, to uh, doing natural language processing, so understanding human text, to doing learning, understanding AI, 
And this talk is going to focus on the parts that understand written text and written inputs and spit them out. So deep learning, natural language processing, um, generative pre-trained transformers, GPTs, and large language models. If you look at the typical OpenAI stack these days, if you do like any kind of training, it's based on Python, which is rather great because I love Python, do make for 20 years, uh, with lots of other software around. So most of them is either built on PyTorch or um, similar software. Um, Llama CPP with Python bindings, DeepSpeed, uh, Foundation was back in the old days NumPy uh, to doing like large matrix operations. And below that you have a stack that has uh, any kind of hardware from CPU, GPU, their HPU, NPU, TPU, XPU, and lots of other processing units, and the support libraries. And on top, if you run any kind of large language model, you need a model with some issues. So the middle part is open source, but it's kind of hard to install most of the times because, yeah, you need to take care of hardware and dependencies. The, um, the other slot below, so the hardware is very expensive. Uh, the drivers are often also proprietary and closed source. And if you get a lot of language model, there's also a problem. And most of them are also closed source. And we want to make it easier for you. So you want to make the whole open source generative AI large language models accessible. That includes uh, working on container stuff. We've been to the Boot C keynote in the morning. Uh, we're building on top of that. We have Portman Desktop to make it uh, more accessible for any kind of people who don't hardcore go on the command line. IBM has worked with that. They have uh, developed a new foundational model which is completely open source. And we have Instruct Lab. So to go a bit deeper with the containers, the current approach we have is to have a boot C container who boots up the system, so you have all the drivers installed, and then an application container you run with all the Python stack and the PyTorch and the llamas and whatever you need in there. Now you might think, well, installing Python package is very, very easy. Just do pip install and you're good. Well, with the hardware accelerator, it gets a bit, a bit more complicated because every vendor has their own API. You need to recompile it for every kind of different system. If you have like rock M, like I, I need to run this command on rel. On Fedora, it looks completely different, so it's not that easy. For Portman Desktop, so this was actually part of the original proposal by Mo. Never used it, so the first time for me firing it up and taking a screenshot just for you, uh, apparently, it's very easy for people uh, who uh, are especially on Mac and Windows uh, to check it out. There's a dedicated Portman AI lab, which will help you to serve and run LLM. And there's also uh, ways to test boot C images. Uh, yeah. And on uh, Fedora, it's just flat, pa flat pack install uh, Portman desktop, and you're good to go. The IBM Granite model, the other piece, the foundational model, so the thing you run, actually, LLM, there was announced during Red Hat Summit. Um, it's an open source licensed model. So you're not under any kind of restriction, uh, commercial restriction. Problem with, with other um, kind of models is either you need to use some kind of service you talk to, so you don't have control over the model, or you have restrictions uh, when to use the model. So you can't use some basic foundation models, commercial context, only like in um, private context. So, but with a open source model, you can actually run it at home, do your own training, or build your own product on top of that. So this is one of the new open source pieces. And finally, we have the, the core. That's the large scale alignment for chatbots. Uh, there's a paper um, made by several IBM engineers who work with us. and. Um, the most important bit is this very complicated sentence, taxonomy guided synthetic data generation process and multi-phase tuning framework. Uh, yeah, I learned some of these words, but I'm still not sure what all these words mean, but I'm going to walk through what the actual effects are and how what the synthetic data generation for taxonomy actually means and why it's so useful. But why we, do we actually need this very complicated thing? Uh, if you never used any kind of AI and work with this, so uh, a model is not a database. So you can't get in to your model file and replace like one row with updated data. If you find a mistake, 
it doesn't work like that. Instead, you have millions of millions of millions of uh, numbers, so tensors, think of vectors and matrices, that have the information somehow encoded in the relationship of the numbers, their weights and their activation things. Yeah, not a data scientist, sorry. But it's very, very hard to change because all the numbers have a relationship. Uh, you need to wriggle on the right side and change something else, and yeah, it doesn't work like that. So that's why we need a way to uh, align a model or fine-tune a model or retrain a model. There are different terms for similar things that do th totally different things on a model, which I also don't understand. But with the lab approach, it, it works a bit like that. You, you download a new model, you chat with it, you figure out, okay, there's a problem. We need to add like new uh, knowledge, or maybe you want to get the output in a specific format, so you need to train the skill. You use a taxonomy approach and the synthetic data generation, trade training data, retrain the model, test it, go through the cycle maybe one or two or three times, and then you have a retrained model. And taxonomy is like that. You have either knowledge, so something you know, or something you can do like a skill. For your knowledge would be to have information like when is this conference or where like DEF CON ZZ in 2024. And uh, the skills are things like how to format the output. Maybe you want to have JSON output or maybe you want to have a specific email template. That would be the skills. And with this approach, you can do training in a way that is like pull request. Like every developer here probably has done pull requests in the past, and you can create information to train a model by just getting some examples in, making a pull request, and done. And then the actual hard part starts for the other end, is this whole training is very, very costly. But uh, we at Red Hat, we're working, currently working with IBM, and uh, what we're going to offer is we have this project where um, when it really starts off, you can make a pull request if you want to add some new training. We're going to take your data, working with IBM. IBM has a data center, and we are doing this training for you and improve the model with the data you're contributing to the community. Um, this will be happening in regular intervals. Regular intervals will be yeah, we don't have fixed numbers, uh, probably longer than a day, uh, shorter than a year, something about that, uh, every couple of weeks, every couple of months. We're also working with other uh, uh, vendors and open source communities and um, institutes that have uh, compute power to give GPUs power to the community. So this is one of the things we're also working on. So. That was the introduction to what we're trying to do to make open source more accessible, AI for open source more accessible. And now let's deep dive him and install Instruct Lab, and I'll show you how that actually works. And if you ever wonder why we have a cute puppy as a dog, well, that's our Labrador. Yeah, this is a whatever. <laughs> uh, also, several warnings here. Um, I was struggling for the last week to get this demo working, and I got it working like in the morning with some very help. So any kind of the commands you will see, the next version of Centracta 117 will change them. Also, the demo I'm running, uh, that's using like the, we call it developer workflow, or the uh, low fidelity approximation. It's not what we actually do for the enterprise or the professional training. Um, any kind of non-ESCII data, we learned that the hardware, uh, uh, the hardway on the weekend, any kind of markup or any kind of non-ESCII characters, uh, yeah, Czech Republic is, uh, yeah, uh, that broke training in a way that completely broke the model. And also, coolly training on Linux with PyTorch is also not working. So I had uh, Grant Shipley help me out. Uh, thank you. Uh, he's a, I think, senior director at RHEL for RHEL platform. Uh, so he has a fancy Mac workstation at home, and he trained the model for me yesterday. So, so yesterday is finished. And I hopefully we'll be able to show that at the end. So to install Instruct Lab, you need either uh, Fedora or uh, Mac OS, or it also works on Windows if you have a Windows subsystem for Linux. 
it needs a lot of free disk space because the models and the tensors and the training data is huge. Uh, Recently, modern Python, although 3.12 does not work well because several of the uh, AI packages don't support 3.12 yet. C, C++ compiler, you really want to have a hardware accelerator, uh, a GPU, otherwise training can take days instead of hours. And also, you need a pretty fancy GPU. So, uh, 6 gigs just for chatting, for inference, and for training, currently, 18 gigs. We work on improvements to make that uh, less restrictive with more quantization. Well, and then just pip install. So this would be installing for CUDA. I have a Rock M system at home. And once you have it installed, you can test it. Uh, we have a, like a sysinfo. Uh, so this is my card at home, the AMD Radeon RX 7900 XT. And if you install it, uh, you, you want to make sure that Llama CPP is supported and installed with GPU offloading. Uh, this is one of the most common bugs we have where people complain that any kind of work with installed apps is super slow because somehow some of the CMake extra lines didn't work out for them on their platform. And then you do the training. So first you initialize your project, creates a config file, you download the new model, you start to chat. Then you may want to modify the taxonomy with new information if you figure out that the chat doesn't give you the data. Uh, Alep diff will give you like the information which file you have changed and check also the file for syntax error. Generate it, generate the new data. That's the syn synthetic data generation. Ah, complicated word. Um, retrain the model and at the end you will have a model file that you can serve and chat again. What would you actually add to a, um, so, okay, sorry, uh, got confused. So this is why the command looks when you output it, so you do alep in it, you need currently extra arguments, you want to use the granite model, that will improve with the next versions too, so uh, I can probably ignore that. Uh, if you download the model, it's then it's very large, so four gigs, you want to have a good internet connection, and then you can start to serve it and finally chat with it. So to ask it like, where is going to be DEF CONF CZ in 2024? So, and here it has some information from previous DEF CONFs because the model was trained uh, a while ago. Uh, still thinks it's typically that in February or March. But as a helpful recommendation, check out the official website. It now comes the problem with the LLMs. LLMs just were very good in telling you and the information that um, they are very good to convince you that no, they know something, although they don't know it actually. So it's called AI hallucinations. So uh, when you ask the model again, like, when is DEF CONS? You may say, okay, we don't know. If you start a new session and ask it again, it may just uh, tell you straight up a lie and say, oh, yeah, well, it's February uh, 7th to 9th. Or, again, well, different dates, it just... Um, telling you lies. That's a problem with uh, large language models. And so this was my, my first attempt to, for this conference to get some uh, useful information from the LLM. I figured out, hmm, I need to teach it better. So this is my knowledge document. Um, there are two pieces. You have seed examples and you have documents. So think of it. The documents are like a textbook. So if you're at university, you get the textbook, read the book. They're all the information you have. And at the very end, you have this pop quiz that will check the information and give you like questions to verify that you actually read the book and learned. And this approach works very, very different. We have uh, very, very similar. We have where you give the system a, a book to read or some text files and then give it some questions as a seed to start like thinking, thinking. Um, so these are like a Git repo and some markdown files. And here was my first mistake because I copy and pasted information from the website and added really nice human readable markdown markup. So bullet points and headers and kept all the check uh, extra um, diacritic symbols in there and that broke training. But 
Again, that will show at the end. Um, let's go back. So create this document here, and then you um, start the actual training and synthetic data generation process. So first of all, you want to check is your file OK. So we'll just do a very simple um, uh, check of the syntax. And then you do um, the generation of the data. And here I told it to generate 300 instructions. So this will generate from the information it has already in the model and the text and the seats, additional questions and answers. So like, this was one of the first things I got out. What is the location? So it's the Faculty of Information Technology in Brno, Czech Republic. Well, that's good. And um, so these questions and these answers, they're all auto-generated by the system. So I didn't do anything. Just started to do fancy things like, what can you tell me about the DEF CON? So now it has the right dates in there. Or where's the closest tram stop? So one of the instructions has the travel instructions. So both how to get to the right airport, go to uh, Bruno Halavni Raji. I hope I said that right. And then to how to get here. And uh, other things that just started to pop out of nowhere is about food, because food for conference is very important. So, and even like popular dishes. So don't know if that's correct, but this sounds correct. So um, like popular dishes in Czech Republic, because those are things that it already knew was already in the LLM in the model. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's probably not entirely correct, but hopefully, yeah. Or like, what do you do in Brunei? Like, go to Swivel Castle, Old Town Hall, the Villa Tugendhat, in the Tugendhaft. Yeah, so, yeah. So, some attractions to do. Yeah, okay, this is, like, it would generate, like, a couple of hundred of these outputs, and then you feed that output into your training model and do the training. And here again, you need to first download about, like, 15 to 20 gigs of additional uh, uh, safe tensors, this is raw data, and then it will train and hopefully eventually, after a long time, um, uh, create a new model. And then you have a new model that you can surf and chat with. And here's where the training completely broke. So I had to ask Grant Shipley to help me out. He did the training on his Mac station, and he also pointed me to a different uh, chat interface. So I still used iLab Surf, but the way how the training worked out at the end, I got um, our chat command can't set something. It's called the GPT temperature. It's like how much randomness is injected into the chat process. Think of it, uh, if you have a very low temperature, it's very like accurate. If you have a very high temperature, it starts to be more like uh, randomized and more, uh, uh, yeah, it's a better word for that. I know you know lots of, yeah. Okay. Yeah, stochastic, yeah. And uh, with a very, very low temperature, I actually got it to give up the right answer. Yeah. And hopefully, I can actually show you that. Uh, if the network is still working. Ah, I think it's still working. Uh, so. Yeah, so this is running the old model. Let's run the new model. So this is the DEF CONF trained model. Now it's starting up. And uh, so you see here it's just loading the stuff into the GPU. And uh, this is a one of our test boxes at Red Hat. And uh, start the GPT client. And uh, fingers crossed. Right answer, so straight away. Yeah, and also starts from the context to give you more information, so it starts to be more helpful. And just stop that, and just to show you what's happened when I run. So this is the original uh, model that doesn't have any of the additional training data in. And it's starting up. Next. Mm. Yeah, so this has the wrong date. So uh, it thinks it's early. Oh, sorry, too fast. 
Yeah. Oh, and she started to hallucinate about DEF CONF 2025, so next year. Yeah. Um, so I can now answer some uh, question answers, and in the meantime, in the background, I'll let the iLab generate running. You can see which f interesting question answer generates in the background. Hi. So, questions? Oh, uh, so the question was if um, the iLab generate uses only the new data or all the data in taxonomy. So if you look at the iLab diff, it only showed the diff of one file. So it does comparison to kind of the main branch to like a PR. So that's for the, the training. We do lo uh, local training or testing training. Again, this is the laptop workflow, the developer workflow. For the things that we're going to do for like the community project, we'll consume all like changes in batch for like a couple of days, weeks, month. Uh, I don't know the hard dates yet. It's still, we're working on that. And then we'll do training on the whole uh, batch of pull requests. And with this approach, actually you could do just consume the whole taxonomy from like the, the first commit to the uh, last commit if you want to retrain another model with the information. This is the adapt uh, additive um, training. So more questions uh, in the back, and then you're in front. <laughs> okay, yeah, the question is if you accept like information on the community, how do we validate and check the data? Yeah, um, humans doing pull request reviews? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a bit hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, currently we, there are uh, people looking at pull requests and helping out. There are also other models where we have a, a like a judge AI that will check that. Uh, again, this is things I, I just heard on the side, I don't know how that's actually going to work. Uh, I'll, I'll also think that's still in the making and the planning phase. Um, but yeah, we will rely on the community to help us to provide good data. It in not includes just providing data, but also helping out to do pull request reviews. So this is this is by the community for the community. Uh, I think you had a question. I think you had a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so the question was, uh, how would you learn about how to build a new home PC? Uh, the problem is, so I did lots of my training at home in February and March when it was rather cold in Germany. I was very happy about that. Because still with the open window, my office room was overheating. So doing the training at home is not like, yeah, you want to heat at home, it's okay. <laughs> but um, there is, uh, I can look it up for you later on. There's one a very um, involved person who wrote a very lengthy log, a blog post about how to do like a semi-professional training at universities. So for like a multi-GPU setup and which GPUs to select. Uh, these days, uh, probably either need to have an NVIDIA or a, a high-end AMD GPU, and even these will only give you uh, this low-quality training. So for the big ones, again, uh, we are talking about, um, that was one of the next slides I had. Uh, you're talking about um, the professional back-end training. You have servers with multiple GPUs or multiple servers and multiple GPUs for several hundred thousands, and this is not a setup you can run at home. And even they take like several days to a week to do the high-end, high-fidelity training. So both the data generation, the training, the fine-tuning, the alignment, and all the other things that go into the workflow. And this is this, uh, the hardware that currently IBM is providing uh, access to for us, so for, for Red Hat. And uh, we'll use that to retrain, and there are conversation with other people, other uh, groups to also help out. But yeah, this is not something you want to actually useful models out there. It's not doable for uh, uh, at home because the, the 
power requirement, the hardware requirement, and even the heating is just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so the question is about how the performance is for integrated, so iGPU, so that's the, like integrated in the, in the CPU. Um, yeah, I don't know it from trouble they had. One of the problems is you need lots of memory and lots of fast memory. So even this model requires five to six gigs of VRAM. If you have a, um, a CPU GPU, the iGPU with a unified memory, this memory is often not as fast efficient as fast as the um, professional or the consumer GPUs, to like dedicated GPUs. That's a problem. It will help, um, but we also, I think right now, only support uh, CUDA uh, interface, which also is ROCKM, uh, in a strange way, uh, Intel Habana, and that's it. So um, InstructLab doesn't support more. PyTorch supports more. And there are also efforts like uh, the Rock M or Intel One API to have a unified API for talking to different uh, processing units and hardware accelerators. So this is still a, a very complicated field that's very complicated field with a lot of um, different vendors trying to provide unified APIs. Yeah, um, there are ideas to like even uh, do something on top of Vulkan or OpenGL. So the successor to uh, OpenGL is Vulkan or Vulkane. Um, to uh, Falcon, yeah, to uh, uh, that these are ideas that people have looking into, but it's a very brand new field. Yeah. So, and one little more, yeah, we have a Slack uh, repo. So if you go to Instruct Lab on GitHub, the community repo, you'll find a Slack invite link to join. And yeah, so it's a summary of what we're trying to do. Um, we hope we're going to save some of you, maybe all of you, I don't know. We're doing our best. Thank you for coming. Thank you for attending. And if you want to know actually more of the technology, uh, please ask to somebody who actually knows AI, uh, not like a uh, mechanic here. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.